Our speaker today is Victor Navosky. Mr. Navosky has been the editor of The Nation magazine since 1978 and has been its publisher and editorial director since 1995. The Nation, however, was founded in 1865 by a group of abolitionists and is noted for its provocative comments. Before joining the nation, Mr. Novosky was an editor at the New York Times Magazine and wrote a column about the publishing business. He is author of the books Kennedy Justice and Naming Names, which won an American Book Award. Mr. Novosky is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Swarthmore, and he is also a graduate of the Yale Law School. Uh, furthering my theory that people seldom or ever uh, educated for the jobs they eventually end up in. <clears throat> He's taught at a number of colleges and universities and has served as a Guggenheim Fellow and as a Ferris Visiting Professor in Journalism at Princeton. In 1994, he enjoyed a year's leave of absence and served as a Fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and then as a senior fellow at the Freedom Forum Media Studies at Columbia University. Mr. Novosky serves on the boards of the Authors Guild, Penn, and the Committee to Protect Journalists, a good organization to belong to when you go around and open up for questions, I think, probably. <clears throat> he has three children and a wife with whom he lives in New York City. Today, Mr. Novosky will utilize the independent traditions of The Nation magazine as he addresses countering the mass media. Please welcome Mr. Victor Novosky. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Um, let's see. Let me begin with a question. Uh, what? So, because you're going to ask me questions later, I get to ask you a question. Uh, what do Ted Koppel, Dan Rather, and Mike Wallace have in common? Anyone have any? Well, think about that while I say. Before I answer my own question, or before you answer my question, um, let me tell you that my goal in my brief uh, remarks here is to persuade you that a small circulation, dissenting, troublemaking journal of opinion like the nation which is said to be perpetually on the brink of bankruptcy, to preach only to the converted, can have as much or more influence as the massest of mass media. Now, who knows the answer to my question? Anybody? Nobody? OK. The answer is, they all wrote for The Nation magazine at the beginning of their careers. <laughs> now. So, by the way, did Albert Einstein, who covered the Disarmament Conference of 1921, a young preacher named Martin Luther King, who wrote an annual civil rights audit for the nation even before he achieved his worldwide reputation, Gore Vidal, who has come out in our pages for the criminalization of firearms and the legalization of drugs, Pat Buchanan, who, when he was still a student, wrote an expose about conditions in an Arkansas prison. And Pat Buchanan always includes the nation on this book jacket uh, identification of publications that he's appeared in, presumably to confuse readers. Who knows? Uh, Ralph Nader, who first published, uh, whose first published article appeared in the nation while he was still a Harvard Law student. It was called The Safe Car You Can't Buy, and it soon became a book. And by some lights, it gave rise to the public interest movement itself. Then there was James Baldwin, Lila Weir, and Vita Wallace. You don't recognize the names of Lila Weir and Vita Wallace. Lila wrote her piece for the nation when she was 12 years old. And uh, it was an interview with Jessica Mitford. She asked her which sister she liked best, whether she kissed on the first date, and things like, you know, serious questions. <laughs> And Vita Wallace is a teenager who came out in our pages for the vote for children. So this could revolutionize our politics. But I mention these names only to suggest that one of the functions of a small independent magazine like The Nation is to, put, is to discover new talent and to put new ideas on the national agenda. Now, let me bring you back to 1865 when the magazine was founded and call your attention to the first sentence in the first paragraph of the first story on the first page 
of the first issue of the nation. The date is July 6th, 1865. Uh, I'm very proud of this sentence. It may be one of the most courageous sentences ever to launch a magazine. So listen closely, like this direct quote, quote, the week was singularly barren of exciting events, end quote. Now think about it. The week has been singularly barren of exciting events. Now I, uh, along with Ham Fish, who's a colleague, we just came out from New York, which is the magazine capital of the country. And trust me when I tell you, it would be unthinkable for Tina Brown, who is the editor of the hot, 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 ultra trendy New Yorker magazine, it would be unthinkable that she would consider leading this great magazine with such a sentence. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it would be unthinkable probably for any uh, mainstream publication in contemporary America to lead their publication with such a sentence. It violates every rule of contemporary journalism. It lacks a peg. It's a sweeping generality. The week was singularly barren of exciting events. There's no evidence to back it up, if you read them. It's judgmental. It's not objective. It's subject. Who's, who says the week? The editor says the week is in. It ignores mainstream journalism's most elementary requirements. For example, if the Oregonian were writing this story, they would have to find a responsible authority figure to quote about the week being singularly barren. So for example, they might say, President Andrew Johnson said today that the week has been singularly barren of exciting events. Now, even so, in a mainstream paper, you couldn't stop there. You would have to have balance. So the second paragraph might read, although Thaddeus Stevens, leader of the Republican majority, observed that given the seizure of certain lands in the Deep South, the week was not that barren of exciting events. <laughs> so. Yet somehow, miraculously, in this business where survival is the ultimate test of success, this little journal, which I'm privileged now to publish, of opinion, which was founded, as you heard, by abolitionists, malcontents, radical reconstructionists, is still publishing. Uh, indeed, it's America's oldest weekly magazine, while hundreds of magazines, thousands have gone under, some, like Collier's and Look and the old Saturday Evening Post, with circulations in the millions. And there's a paradox here. It's still around largely because its backers and editors down through the years and writers have always cared more about what the nation stood for than about what it earned. So uh, as a matter of fact, since you all took the trouble to come here today, I thought I would share with you the secret of our success. Uh, and, and Howard Shapiro, who, who helped uh, get us out here, tells me that I can trust you not to violate this confidence that I'm about to share with you. Uh, that camera, I assume, will not record this because <laughs> I'm worried about this. Our secret is that we have lost money for virtually every one of the 133 years that we've been publishing. Now, I'm serious because what this means is that we are more a cause than a business. That, that the people who have been responsible for this publication have put idealism ahead of expedience on every occasion when they were in tension with each other. When E.L. Gotkin, who was the founding editor, found himself under attack from the nation's chief backer, who was a lead pipe manufacturer, for running frivolous articles like a day in, at the races in Saratoga, rather than devoting more pages to the radical reconstructionist program favored by the nation's uh, financiers, what do you think he did? Uh, did he change his editorial emphasis, which is what happens every day in the United States, you read what's going on in the press? Not at all. He fired his backers. <laughs> or rather, he reorganized his company. He organized a new company which guaranteed him editorial independence. And oh yes, I should mention, the, the writer who covered a day at the races in Saratoga, he was an unknown journalist named Henry James. <laughs> 65 years later, when the nation's pub then publisher, a Wall Street uh, banker named Maurice Wertheim, better known later as Barbara Tuckman's father, she was a 
young reporter for The Nation as well. He found himself on the receiving end of daily complaints from his Wall Street confreres who objected to the magazine's support of FDR's New Deal. And what do you think he did? He called in the editor, Frieda Kirschway. He told her of his problem. And did he tell her to change her editorial policy? Did he fire her? No. He firmly insisted that she agree to buy the magazine. His asking price was $30,000. She told him that she could only come up with $15,000, so he lent her the other $15,000 to buy the magazine so he could get along. Now, in case there are any potential investors out there, I don't want to minimize either our business practices or our business prospects. Uh, first, you should know that this magazine is famously frugal. Although it's not true, as our house humorist Calvin Trillin has repeated from coast to coast, that he has paid in the high two figures. <laughs> when we had our conversation about compensation for his humor column, he asked what he was going to be paid. I told him, for the privilege of writing for the America's oldest weekly magazine, you want to be paid? Uh, we told him we were thinking about something in the high two figures. In fact, we ended up paying him $100 a column, not a penny more, a penny less. Now, you have to forgive a brief detour here, a personal experience I had. Once Trillin was on The Tonight Show in the old days, when Johnny Carson was the, the host, and my father, who was 92 years old, heard that this nation columnist was going to be on there. And so he proudly stayed up late to see Trillin. And uh, uh, he, Trillin told Johnny about his rate of pay to much laughter. And Johnny asked him if he could describe the nation for the audience, which hadn't heard of it. So Trillin cocked one eyebrow and said, how would I describe the nation? Pinko. <laughs> the next morning, my father called. I said, don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> Actually, the economics of the nation, like the economics of most journals of opinion, are beyond comprehension to most people in traditional business. When I arrived at the nation in 1978, we had 20,000 subscribers. And you know, the big thing in magazines these days is demographics. You want to have a lot of young people subscribing to your magazine. And when a friend of mine, the radical journalist Jack Newfield, uh, heard I had been hired as editor of The Nation, he asked how many paid subscribers we had. And I said, we have 20,000, but 8,000 are libraries. This seemed impressive to me because libraries have more readers per copy than individual subscribers. But Jack's response was, oh, 8,000 libraries and 12,000 nursing homes. Now, Ham Fisher's, jo Ham Fisher's joke is that when our subscribers expire, they really expire. But the truth is, we now have something over 100,000 subscribers, and 15,000 of them belong to a group that we call Nation Associates, who send an annual gift over and above their subscription price. And they do it because they think this magazine is important. And Ham Fisher's joke turned out to be no joke. So many people remember us in their wills that we literally have started a little club called the Legacy Group, telling people how they can remember us in their will. And when a reporter from the New York Times got a hold of our brochure describing the Legacy Group, she was astonished. And she asked whether we knew of any other magazine that had asked subscribers to remember them in their will. We didn't. But when you think about it, even though The Nation is technically, non, is technically a for-profit magazine, despite our losses, if we were non-profit, we wouldn't be allowed to endorse candidates for public office. We wouldn't be allowed to devote the substantial amount of resources to trying to influence legislation. Uh, even though we are a for-profit magazine, we are an educational institution. So why shouldn't we behave like other educational institutions? That reminds me, by the way, when Ronald Reagan was first elected president, I received a call from the White House, and they told us that the White House was cutting back on its subscription budget, and would we donate a complimentary copy to the new president? <laughs> so I, the White House Library, so I discussed it with my colleagues, and we called them back, and we said that we were pleased to offer Reagan a subscription at our special student rate. <laughs> uh, Our theory was that as a proponent of supply-side economics, he could use the education we could supply. So, anyway. But the bottom line about the economics of most journals of opinion is that they don't, as a rule, justify themselves in the marketplace. 
We think the nation might make ends meet, actually, in this new world of the new media, because we have a 133-year archive that we can put out there on the internet or put out there in a CD-ROM form, but, uh, which might actually bring some uh, revenue into the magazine. But that, that's another story. William F. Buckley, Jr. was asked once whether his magazine, the conservative bi-weekly National Review, would ever make a profit. And that avatar of free market economics is reported to have said, a profit? A profit? You don't expect the church to make a profit, do you? <laughs> the irony is that when one studies the landscape of magazines in America, one gradually realizes that, that this progressive, radical, uh, liberal, whatever you want to call it, Stalinist, neo-Stalinist, uh, we've been called all these things, by the way, magazine, uh, communist, socialist, they've called us anti-Semitic and they've called us Zionist. And uh, when they really want to uh, get us in trouble, they call us ideological. And of course, I believe, yeah, the nation has the ideology of the liberal left, National Review has the ideology of the right, and uh, the New York Times, NBC, CBS, and ABC have the ideology of the center, and it's part of the ideology of the center to deny that it has an ideology. And uh, so we're, we're all in that game together. Um, but the irony is, when you realize that, that this progressive magazine has been deeded something of what I think of as a triple monopoly. And that's the way to think of, of us as a business. It's embarrassing to be a monopolist uh, for a magazine like ours. Well, let me explain how it works. First, we have a monopoly on weekly progressive journalism. There is, as I have already mentioned, Bill Buckley's National Review, which is actually a bi-weekly, but they're on the right. And we have inaugurated a series of debates with them, which are sometimes carried on C-SPAN, public radio, and elsewhere. You can ask for them to be shown on your local station. We've debated National Review on affirmative action, on the death penalty, on proposal to uh, abolish the National Endowment for the Arts. Then, there's Rupert Murdoch's new magazine, The Weekly Standard. It's edited by Bill Kristol, uh, Dan Quayle's old speechwriter, the former son, the son of uh, the public interest editor, Irving Kristol. And it's also edited by John Podoritz, the son of commentary editor, Norman Podoritz, and Midge Dechter, his mother. And the magazine, uh, the Weekly Standard sort of combines the politics of the daughters of the American Revolution with the politics of the sons of the New York neoconservative intellectuals. <laughs> then there is the New Republic magazine. When I first came to the nation, more than once I had the experience, I'd be at a place like this and someone would say, what do you do? I'd say, I work at the nation. Then they would say, oh, the nation and the New Republic. I used to get those <laughs> as if they were joined at the hip, and there were no difference between them. And that may have been true. It, it was certainly true politically uh, back uh, 50 years ago or more. They, they even almost merged, actually, at that time. But these days, uh, one Washington wag has suggested that the New Republic should change its name to even the New Republic, because it's hard to pick up a copy of the Washington Post or the New York Times, which mentions the New Republic, that doesn't say something like, even the New Republic now supports the death penalty. <laughs> or even the New Republic opposes affirmative action. So call it even the New Republic. Um, second, besides our monopoly on weekly pro progressive journalism, we have, or these journals as, as, a, as a collectivity, as a class, have a monopoly on independent journalism, with the exception of Murdoch's one. Earlier, I mentioned some of the ways that a troublemaking, dissenting journalism like The Nation uh, differs from mainstream journalism and magazines. And if this were last year, I would have told you that unlike, say, Playboy or Penthouse, we don't have centerfolds. But last year, we did run our first centerfold. Uh, only those in the first row will be able to see it, but I just wanted to show you so you'll know you can trust me on these matters. This is our centerfold. What it consists of is not a nude woman, but one, two, three, four octopus. You, you can see these octopi. One of them is General Electric, one is Time Warner, one is uh, Disney Cap Cities, and one is Westinghouse. And it shows in the small print every single property they own in radio, television, publishing, music. It's an amazing chart. And it, it 
takes away our claim never to have published a centerfold, but it does demonstrate something that I think is very important about the, our, the second monopoly that we have. And it's, uh, uh, let me just get this here. Uh, it shows that more and more publications uh, and news media are owned by fewer and fewer enterprises. Uh, when Ben Bagdikian, who is the uh, former dean of the uh, Berkeley School of Journalism, wrote his book Media Monopoly at the beginning of the 1980s, he counted 50 companies, 5-0, that dominated more than half of all of the newspapers, magazines, book records, CD-ROM, all of, of the information and entertainment and knowledge country, companies in this country. And then there was a new edition of his book put out about five or six years later, and the number of transnational, of, of corporations that dominated the media environment were down to 27. And then we asked him to do a projection for the nation a few years ago of how many companies there would be by the end of the century, and he had the number down to six. So in our judgment, no issue is more urgent than how to make these uh, entities accountable to the readers, listeners, and viewers, but, but I get a little ahead of myself. Uh, independence, which, which is characteristic of a magazine like The Nation, means that you're beholden to no one. And it's a concept that's difficult for those who are beholden to the market or to advertisers uh, to understand. Perhaps the best way to make the point is to tell you what happened on the occasion of the nation's 120th anniversary when we put together a special issue on how perceptions of the United States had changed over the last 25 years. And we invited observers from countries around the world to give us their impressions of the US uh, and how they had changed over the previous 25 years. Carlos Fuentes, the great novelist from Mexico, wrote that that we're left with this final image of the United States, which in his view used to stand for freedom and liberty, he said, it, now he said the image that he's left with is a democracy inside, but an empire outside. Dr. Jekyll at home, Mr. Hyde in Latin America. Margaret Atwood talked about pressing her nose against uh, the window pane of the US from Canada. And we asked Gore Vidal, who split his time between Ravello and Los Angeles, uh, to give us the view from Ravello, which he proceeded to do in a brilliant essay on America as an empire. Anyway, shortly thereafter, I received a, lit a written invitation to have lunch with one of those publishers who specialize in centerfolds, Bob Guccione, the proprietor of Penthouse Magazine. I came on elegant invitation from Mr. Guccione and his wife. And uh, they have a famous collection of, of statues and art, and I wanted, was happy to go look at their statuary and their art. So uh, I showed up at the appointed hour, and after being taken on a tour of his magnificent uh, museum in this East Side mansion, we were joined by his circulation, marketing, and advertising executives, and fine wines were served, and he asked me how much it cost to get Gore Vidal to contribute that essay to that issue. When I told him that we paid each of the contributors to that special issue $25, he almost choked on his $100 glass of wine. <laughs> and he told me that he had offered Vidal, I think it was $50,000 for an article, and Vidal had declined. Guccione, Guccione then proceeded to pass out Cuban cigars and brandy and to muse about how perhaps he might be interested in buying the nation. Indeed, he said, he had been thinking about it for some time. Of course, the irony is that people like Vidal write for the nation because it is independent. I would never write for someone like Penthouse's publisher at Nation Prices. Which raises the matter of the third monopoly needed, uh, which um, I think journals of opinion as a genre uh, preside over. And these staple artifacts of the print culture, th th these fold-outs, uh, uh, the, these um, uh, uh, emblems of rigorous uh, analysis and debate, the, these things which stand for the power of reason and the importance of moral argument, uh, 
are all involved in this third monopoly that, that we have here. Uh, and, and it's the mainstream press in, in our time has been tabloidized, it's been sensationalized, it's been soundbiteized, it's been Murdochized, far too much imp information produced by the mega conglomerates that dominate the new media landscape is commercialized, bureaucratized, and homogenized. By creating a press which incessantly appropriates, consumes, and recycles ideas, the much celebrated market has turned over to this shrinking band of small circulation periodicals, a monopoly on the business of serious political discourse. Uh, a few years ago, I embarked on a book project with my unerring instinct for the bestseller, I persuaded my publisher that the world was waiting for the definitive book on the Journal of Opinion. And one of the reasons I thought it was worth doing was that no one had ever done it before, as far as I knew. And, and of course, that alone might have alerted a more canny business head that the market prospects for such a project were dim at best. But I preferred to take it as a good sign. I quickly discovered, however, that these magazines had an unlikely Boswell in the philosopher uh, uh, and sociologist and scholar uh, Jürgen Habermas, whom I had previously regarded as uh, indecipherable, both because his jargon-ridden translated from the German prose uh, and his historic connection to the Frankfurt School uh, that bastion of something called critical theory, which I found indecipherable in its own right, put me off. I had heard of this guy vaguely, but, uh, and I knew that a lot of people who are in the academy respected him as the great theorist of, of communications in our time, but, but I'd never read him. And, uh, but it turned out that Habermas, who, who had um, perfected the notion of the meaning of the public sphere, which, is, which I put halfway between the political or governmental sphere, sphere and the private or personal sphere, uh, that he identified the journal of opinion as sort of the house organ to the public sphere. And he elaborated his theory in a book which he jointly titled The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere and Inquiry into a Category of Bourgeois Society. And it was not translated into English or published uh, uh, in this country until 1989, although he wrote it in 1962, as I mentioned. But its first half turned out to include an ambitious analytic history of the organic connection between these journals and opinion formation in democratic society. And uh, stripped bare, by the way, Habermas's theory in the Enlightenment tradition includes the idea that to flourish, democracy demands conversation. It demands open argument. It demands debate. This happened, at least for white males, in the city-states of ancient Greece. It happened again, Habermas observed, in 16th century Europe when the conditions of capitalism led to the coming together of private citizens to debate public issues in an open way, what he calls the bourgeois public sphere. And he traces this development, interestingly, to the coffee houses, which grew out of the salons of court, but also to the periodical press, which set the agenda of coffee house debate, especially in England, where censorship was minimal. By the beginning of the 18th century, there were an estimated 3,000 coffee houses in London alone. It could have been Portland or Seattle, by my count. Um, unlike the earlier newsletters, which had reported on the journeys of princes and foreign dignitaries, on balls and other news of and from the court. These new periodicals, like Addison and Steele's Spectator, The Tatler, Defoe's Review, included essays and satires that criticized Parliament and the Crown. And because this criticism was carried out in public, it had something of a transforming effect on Parliament and helped to usher in an era of parliamentary democracy. And so, when I was invited to a symposium in Copenhagen, I, I said yes, provided my ticket included a stopover in Frankfurt. And uh, eventually, I got in touch with Habermas, who sort of reluctantly agreed to see me, and I went up to his uh, cigarette smoke-filled office in a gray university building, 
And uh, he made a number of, of brilliant Habermasian points, which I won't burden you with today, although one of them, when I asked him what he thought about the disappearance of the institutions of public debate in our society, with the exception of, of the Journal of Opinion, uh, what he had to say about it, he said, breakfast. I said, say what? He said, breakfast. He said, breakfast is a critical institution by which I mean that the reading of the morning paper at breakfast, you're sitting there with your cup of coffee and the paper, you said, and remember, the site, which is this German paper, is much closer uh, to what Americans mean by a journal of opinion than most American newspapers. He said, it gives you time to consider rational argument. It's the one point in the day when you can, you, you read it and you think about it. The morning paper, he said, is embedded with deep-seated cultural attitudes calling for time and attention, the scarcest of resources. Anyway, he had all kinds of wise things to say, and then eventually I worked up my courage and got to the $64 question, and I asked, what would you say is the role of the Journal of Opinion in the era of the electronic media and the internet? And he looked at me with what I took to be pity, as if to say, any fool would know the answer to that, and indeed, he said that the answer was simple. It was obvious. As, and as soon as he said it, it was obvious. But to me, who had been thinking about these journals, I'd been working for one for 15, 16 years, I'd been studying them for this book for the last few years, it, his statement had the clarity of the Liberty Bell. What he said was, the role of these little journals was to set the standard of reasoned argumentation to set the standard for serious political discourse. So let me um, say that there are then, if you think about it, two fundamentally different views of the role of the Journal of Opinion and its ability to influence the political culture. In the, the first view, which I began with, it can put new ideas on the agenda as our late contributing editor E.P. Thompson did with his brilliant posing of the need to protest the spread of nuclear weapons. It can inspire a movement, as Ralph Nader did, the public interest movement, and Ronnie Duggar, the editor of the Texas Observer, recently did in The Nation with a call for a progressive alliance, which resulted in thousands of people getting together around the country to organize to do something about the transnational corporation. It can explain the underlying meaning of events, as Ben Bagdikian did uh, with his, uh, not just with his computation of the uh, conglomeratization and, and uh, the increasing trend of it, but explaining why media concentration leads to homogenization and a flattening of the news. It can shape or influence the culture, as our columnist Katha Pollitt does every other week through the power of her ideas, her, her she uses um, her language and her, her moral argument and her sense of humor. It can um, cut institutions and individuals down to size, as Fred Cook used to do with his exposés of the FBI and the CIA, and as we have done more recently with exposés of the special prosecutor, Kenneth Starr, and the nation did a major piece on his conflicts of interest as you may know, he uh, uh, stayed on as manager of his law firm, but he um, neglected to inform the American people that one of the clients of this law firm was the Resolution Trust Corporation, which was a major player in the Whitewater investigation that he was conducting. And uh, he also neglected to mention that his law firm had reached a secret settlement with the Resolution Trust after he became special prosecutor, where a few hundred thousand dollars changed hands. Um, so it can offer visions of a better future, as Jay Wall Jasper did and does in his series on what works. And he did one recently on Portland. I don't know how many of you saw it. I'd be interested to know what you think about it. And um, it can monitor the mass media and, and serve as a critic of it, even as it does so. So that's one way in which these journals influence and affect our lives. The second view, the Habermasian view, it can set the standard for others to emulate. So it's not a bad mix. Habermas, Koppel, Rather, and Mike Wallace. And uh, 
Oh yeah, I forgot about Tom Brokaw, who owes us an article on Native Americans. And uh, I want to uh, end, uh, finally I want to end, I, I say finally because John Kenneth Galbraith once told me that you always say finally when you have about five minutes to go because it puts the audience at their ease. And, uh, so, uh, that, but, but I want to uh, tell you a story about Tom Brokaw and something that happened, which, which for me sort of sums up the relationship of uh, folks like us who are involved with the world of journals of opinion to the folks like him, uh, the mass media, the anchors of the uh, So um, let me share it with you. Uh, I wrote a book called Naming Names about congressional investigations into Hollywood uh, during the blacklist years, the McCarthy years. And when it was first published, um, I was invited to be on the Today Show, and its host was then Tom Brokaw who now does the nightly news for NBC. He conducted his interview, but before he did, he leaned over and he said, listen, I want to talk to you when this is over. So don't leave. So I said, fine, I'd love to talk to Tom Brokaw. Uh, and I stuck around to see what he wanted to discuss. So after the thing was over, he's a very intelligent interviewer. He, he said to me, are you aware, he asked me, of the list the nation ran of journalists who are on the take from the Shah of Iran. The Shah was still running Iran in those days. So, yes, I said, I, I, I was aware of that list. Are you aware, he said, that my name is on that list? Yes, I said, I'm aware that your name is on that list. So, well, he said, I thought that was a very poor story. It was not a very good story. Why? I, I asked, did, did the writer get it wrong? Uh, did you not receive the gifts as reported? And the story was actually a chart with the names of journalists, TV journalists on the left, and on the right, the gifts that they had received, the specific gifts that each one had received were enumerated on the right. Oh no, he said, the story was accurate. So, what's the problem, I asked. Why don't you think it was a good story? Well, he said, the story included only TV journalists and print journalists, including the head of the New York Times Bureau at the time, he said, have been on the take from the Shah for years. Why, why, why only TV journalists? Second, he said, all I got was a bottle of champagne and a tin of caviar. Uh, and he said, I tried to return it. But when I did, the Shah's ambassador, who would take a truck around and distribute these things as he would go into newsrooms around Washington, a guy named Zahedi, uh, he refused to take it back. And he kept saying, Tootsie Rolls, Tootsie Rolls. The caviar is like Tootsie Rolls, take it. And, and Brokaw said to me, what was important to me was that Zahedi was in charge of the Shah's interview schedule. And that uh, he... Uh, did not want to insult Zahedi by giving him his gift back, insist on giving him his gift back, and because he wanted to get his interview with the Shah. And Brokaw told me, indeed, he said, I got two interviews with the Shah, and I asked him tough questions, and it made some news. And a good story would have reported all that. So, so I said the following thing to him. Well, I said, uh, your point is well taken. I, you can't argue with any of those specific points he made. But let me tell you how it looked to me at the time that we made the decision to do this and what happened at the nation. A talented journalist came to us and told us she had the documentation of journalists who were on the take from the shop, but that her story was promised to the Columbia Journalism Review, which is a, a magazine put out by the Columbia Journalism School that covers the press. But, she said, because they were a bi-monthly and because she was worried that she might be scooped and we were a weekly, she was willing to let the nation publish the list of TV journalists because they were the most newsworthy and she, she wanted to get, make sure that she got credit for that and that the story got out right away. So I took a look at the list and there I saw the name of Brokaw, among others. So here was my dilemma, I, I explained to him. I had a book on the brink of publication I knew my publisher had submitted the book to the Today Show for possible uh, consideration, for a possible interview. So what to do? So it's a classic conflict of interest. So what I chose to do was I recused myself from the decision, but I told our executive editor that whatever 
he decided was fine by me, but that whatever he did, uh, he should make damn sure that this thing was fact-checked to a fairly well, uh, that we had to be sure that it was right. And indeed, Nation chose to publish it, and they, it appeared, and that's how it got in the magazine. So Broker said fine, and we each went our separate ways. And uh, I then went down to the corner grocery store, and I bought the cheapest tin of caviar they had for $2.50, and I sent it to Tom Brokaw with a little note thanking him for the difficult questions that he had posed to me. And uh, about a week later, I received the following letter in the mail. It said, Dear Victor, thank you for the caviar. Given the respective finances of the nation and the Shah of Iran, you have me in your grip as the Shah never did. Yours sincerely, Tom Brokaw. I thank you. <laughs> Victor, I thank you very much for your courage and your humor as you approach your profession. My question has, requires a little background, and some of which I think you've been made aware of. A year ago, Oregon voted on a, a measure to allow doctors-assisted suicide. The measure was appro approved by a 2% margin. Ten days ago, we voted on a measure to repeal the initial measure. The, rep the repeal failed by a 60 to 40 percent margin. There are two points to remember. The repeal measure was largely financed by the Catholic Church and a consortium of religious con conservatives, reportedly spending in excess of $5 million, mostly from outside the state, in advertising, an amount roughly five times more than the opposition. In the last week before the election, the Oregonian, our state's only major statewide daily paper, ran five consecutive two-column, practically full-page length editorials in support of the measure and mim minimum coverage of opposing views in the letters of the, to the editor uh, section. My question is two. Would you comment on whether or not the first infringed on the concept of separation of church and state in our public affairs? And secondly, if the second abused the intended protection of the freedom of the press? The second being? The freedom of the press. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, it may be that I'd have to know a lot more of the facts that the uh, church support for uh, the proposition uh, went over the line. I can't know about it. That, uh, as someone who kind of applauded Martin Luther King's operations during the civil rights struggle, it's hard for me to um, get over-exercised about that, although I, I'm a deep respecter of the importance of separation between church and state. And on the merits of the issue itself, um, the nation, you should know, nominated uh, Dr. Kevorkian for a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Dr. Frank Oski wrote a very eloquent statement about that, so I'm not ex the most objective observer on these matters. Um, you know, I, it's, I think newspapers do themselves a disservice when they don't give space to the other side. And we, when, when uh, I got to the nation, we moved the letters column from the back to the front, and uh, we go out of our way to, to print letters that are critical of what we do, although we always give our writers a chance to respond in the same issue on the theory that the reader then gets the benefit of the argument. So I don't know that it's a First Amendment problem, but it's a... Uh, it's, it's outside the spirit of what the First Amendment was intended to achieve, and that's, that's what I would say about that. So thanks for those good questions. Now, do I have any other questions? There's a microphone up here, and uh, fire away. I'm Andrew Kayser, member of the City Club. It's my recollection that 25 years ago, the only political pundits on TV were James K. Kilpatrick and Nicholas von Hoffman arguing for three minutes on 60 Minutes. 
Now it appears that all the cable networks have zillions of talking heads yelling and screaming at each other. Are they truly contributors to the public discourse, as you discussed earlier, or are they actually a detraction from its efficiency? Um, are the pundits on uh, television, the talking heads, truly uh, contributors to public discourse, or are they detractors from the kind of conversation? Um, let's see. First of all, uh, one of our writers, uh, Eric Alterman, wrote a book called The Sound and the Fury, The Washington Punditocracy, in which he analyzed this phenomenon and, and denounced it. And then he was immediately invited to be a talking head on MSNBC <laughs> television. And he hasn't fully resisted the temptation. Um, I think that they are, uh, before I answer your question, let me say that there's an observation I would make that, that there are journalists who uh, were pretty good journalists and the more television they do, the less impressive their print journalism is. It takes up a lot of time uh, to put on the makeup, uh, to uh, you know, get the right wardrobe, and uh, to come up with these sound bites. And uh, I regard it as primarily an entertainment medium rather than a news medium when you see these folks shouting at each other. However, uh, I occasionally learn something. And uh, Crossfire, for example, where you got a half hour to have your difference of opinion, for many years, to me, told the truth about the question of balance, what so-called balance in the network world. They would have, on the right, Pat Buchanan, this Neanderthal right-wing uh, guy. And on the left, Tom Braden, former CIA officer. Well, <laughs> Seemed to me, you know, the choice was not quite there. And uh, I, uh, but, but occasionally you do learn something from these shows, and issues are joined, but it is occasionally. Uh, Ted Koppel, for example, did a, uh, a show recently based on an article that appeared in The Nation. It was an expose of the FBI by David Burnham, a reporter who used to work for The New York Times. But it was very unusual. Uh, Expose. It wasn't a denunciation of the Bureau uh, the way that Fred Cook used to do it in the Cold War days, and they deserved it for their violation of civil liberties and civil rights. And uh, it was, he, he found that for the last 15 years, law enforcement agencies across the board had been collecting statistics on the number of cases that were reported, the number that were prosecuted, the numbers that were won, the numbers that were lost, the numbers that were settled. And no one had ever bothered to take these statistics and figure out what they meant. And he went, and, and under the Freedom of Information Act, he set up a, a data bank, and he retrieved all of this vast warehouse of statistics with the help of a professor from Syracuse University. They found that the FBI, which has this great reputation despite some problems with its lab, as being the most efficient of all our law enforcement uh, detective agencies, investigative agencies, turned out to have the worst record of convictions of any of the other intelligence agencies in government. Well, Ted Koppel uh, devoted a half hour of his hour-long program, of his 35-minute program, to uh, giving Burnham the space to lay out his argument, and then uh, gave the FBI a chance to respond. And um, it was a case where the Bureau, which usually uh, is pretty good about putting out information in defense of itself, I think was outclassed by the, the, the work that Burnham and his colleague had done. But it was a lesson for, for the viewer that you rarely get. And so it was a case where the two media worked to complement each other. And then the new media came in, and Burnham put all the statistics up so that you can dial WWW, FBI, or whatever the dot number is and get a lot more information if you want to follow up on it. And other people were invited to send their comments in. So, so there's one place where it worked. Thanks. Yes, sir. Paul Milius, City Club member and Nation subscriber. Uh, ah, my copies good. of The Nation tend to collect a bit on my coffee table until I feel a need to refuel my sense of outrage. Uh, <clears throat> however, okay. um, we have been hearing lately uh, about uh, this, this uh, fewer numbers of companies uh, uh, controlling more and more media. Um, I believe it's the Los Angeles Times as a policy or is trying to establish a policy where their business uh, 
and advertising uh, work hand in hand with their editorial comments in order to, to gain some uh, cohesive picture of the news or whatever. And uh, we hear of Chrysler insisting that uh, any articles that are controversial be pre-approved by them in, in publications in which they advertise. Um, uh, my question is, at what point does either a corporate or, uh, or does, does corporate or self-censorship of the media uh, become as inimical to free discourse in a democratic society as state control of the media? I think uh, it's a good question. Self-censorship is the first and, and universal problem to media, and it happens in uh, every way that you might imagine. It happens because uh, somebody wants to get ahead and doesn't want to uh, uh, ruffle feathers at the top. It happens because someone believes wrongly sometimes that the publisher will uh, disapprove or that it's outside the bounds of what's done. It happens because the editor on a major metropolitan daily has to make budgetary choices and he doesn't want to commit monies to stories that are uh, going to be difficult to report because, say, take the FBI story, because the FBI is not going to give any cooperation. So then you're going to get a very expensive uh, story that's going to take a very long time, and the, the result might not be there. But if you don't commission such stories, it operates as a form of self-censorship. And, uh, and then there is political censorship, sexual censorship, uh, so I think that that's a uh, profoundly important issue, that the, the solution lies in part with individual will and courage, but in part it lies with transforming the political culture and raising everybody's consciousness about the need to be open and uh, for, for reporters in the newsroom to lobby to build in incentives for uh, anti-censorship in incentives. So. Yes, sir. John Leeper, City Club member. Hi. Uh, reference your second question back. <clears throat> A short statement that I heard years ago, I think is apt concerning statistics. That is to the effect that figures don't lie, but liars figure. <laughs> My question to you is, sir, as an average citizen, particularly in Portland and the state of Oregon, where we did have such, in my mind, biased coverage of Measure 51. How does the average citizen get balanced information about the news, both from the print press as well as from radio and television? Good question. Uh, how does the average citizen get balanced news? T to me, you don't get it by um, kind of he said, she said journalism, where you just get two views out there. And if, if you will give me this issue of the nation with the China on the cover, I'll just read you one paragraph which speaks to that point and then come to the rest of what you had to say. This is an article. Uh, by Bill McKibben, uh, if, it's, if, I can, if it's in here, it is. And he's talking about global warming. And here's what he has to say about it. He says, if I can. Well, he says that there is this, this group of scientists uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1995, a vast gathering of climatologists endorsed the notion that people were heating up the earth and that the future held dramatic and dangerous increases in temperature. Though research continues, scientists aren't generally ideologues. Almost all have changed their minds. They gave policymakers reasonably precise warnings about how hot things will get and what the effects of the heat will be the dialectical method that we call science was vindicated, but not, I think, the journalistic method. Its ability to deal with fundamental and complicated questions has never been more in question. 
And then he tells that after the initial burst of scare stories, articles about greenhouse science were dominated by the doubters. Each counter theory was worth a story. While the greenhouse effect was still up in the air, that made sense. But after the IPCC announced the vast consensus on the issue, the handful of skeptics were still treated as equal players, their views flavor, flavoring every story. Three or four skeptical scientists continue to be faithfully called and quoted, even after authors like Ross Gelbspand and groups like Ozone Action have made it clear that with rare exceptions, their research is subsidized, these folks, by corporate interests. And he describes that science as being on a par with the Tobacco Institute's uh, reports on tobacco uh, not being addictive and not causing cancer. Now, there's always a problem of whose numbers you take, as you suggested, and of whose research you take, and however. But uh, I think different journalistic uh, formulas and approaches are appropriate to different kinds of stories. And the only way, as a consumer of news, that I've found to uh, uh, satisfy myself about who do you trust is a combination of things. First of all, opinion trusteeship. You find someone who you trust over time on the things that you do know about, and then when they're researching something that you don't know about, or they cite sources you don't know about, it's like a restaurant critic or a movie critic, you, you tend to give them the benefit of the doubt. Secondly, I believe it's very important to have alternative sources of news so that when you get uh, these conflicts, you, you, they, that the major media are monitored by independent and alternative media, and that you then are, are thrown back on your own resources to pick and choose, but again, at least you have the benefit of the alternative information and theories. And thirdly, as McKibben suggests here, you want to look at who's paying for the research that comes out and know where they come from, if it's an impartial, so-called impartial uh, you know, professor who's been studying this thing for 20 years, I might look at it differently than if the Tobacco Institute of America uh, comes out with a finding. So those would be three ways that I would think of responding to your question. Uh, Sean Brennan, City Club member. Um, on the radio last, uh, I think it was last spring, I listened to Robin McNe uh, Robert McNeil was on a book tour, and he talked about when he was on his uh, news hour show how they felt they really wanted to make sure that they always presented neutral, both sides of issues, whereas they have, of course, major corporate sponsors, um, ADM being one of them, and they would come out with a story critical of ADM. Um, and he kind of explained how they felt that they were successful and they maintained the sponsorship even after being corporate uh, critical of the company. How would you say that their uh, efforts to remain you know, neutral and unbiased have been, and are there any other, would you say, major you know, examples you know, of that kind of uh, ability. Uh, say a number of things about them. Uh, one funny thing, about five years ago, I was uh, invited to a conference of American and uh, former Soviet, they, they were in the midst of transition, but former Soviet television journalists uh, and others who were discussing what the new Soviet or post-Soviet uh, media scene was gonna be like. And they were talking about uh, privatization and how it was going to, you know, end this era of propaganda. They'd have great programs like uh, Bill Moyers and McNeil Lara, and they cited all these programs which you can only get on public television here. So that uh, the first point was, it's better than most of what you get elsewhere in uh, the media these days. Having said that, um, this idea of balance is, to me, the ultimate relative idea, and it reminds me of the story that the anthropologist Clifford Geertz tells about the fellow who comes to his, uh, uh, the servant who comes to his master in India and says, do you know that the, the world is carried on the back of a great turtle? And uh, his master says, well, uh, no, and, and he said, oh yes, and the turtle is, he says, what does the turtle stand on? He says, well, the turtle stands on the back of another turtle. And he says, what does that turtle stand on? And he said, oh, after that, it's turtles, 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 all the way down. <laughs> and the point is that, you know, it's, you have to have some basis for which you make a comparison of that sort. So w is it balanced between Democrats and Republicans? Is it balanced between anarchists and vegetarians? Is it balanced between nation readers and uh, national review readers? Um, I think they do a good job uh, in the sense that uh, they, they 
attempt uh, in a sophisticated way to deal with uh, uh, different views as defined by the unarticulated center. The problem is that you get radical theorists, like someone asked yesterday about Noam Chomsky and whether we publish him in The Nation. He's a, you know, a radical analyst who's based at, at MIT. He's a, a um, semanticist by trade, but he is a, someone who has written uh, and thought deeply about the Middle East, about American policy in Vietnam and elsewhere. And uh, he's uh, never on McNeil era. And, and he's beyond the limits of uh, tolerance for most conventional television networks. So you can get far right thinkers, but you don't get this kind of Marxist left thinker usually. Uh, they did have Erwin Noel from the Progressive as one of their regular roundtable of columnists, which is quite unusual. Erwin uh, was a pacifist, and he's someone who didn't vote on principle, so that was, uh, it seemed to me, a tribute to their uh, casting operation. But I, I once asked Chomsky about it, about it, and he said that he, sometimes he gets invited and doesn't go on these programs, and the reason is that he, uh, if he's asked, uh, who is the greatest terrorist in the world today? And he says, Saddam Hussein, there's no problem. But if he's asked who is the greatest terrorist in the world today, and he says, George Bush, time of the Gulf War, they think he's a raving lunatic. Un and unless he gets a half hour to explain what he means, and, what, you know, and why he says it, and what state terrorism means, and what the body count of uh, Iraqis was, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there is that problem in addition. It's not just putting two heads up there who stand for different things. It's giving them the opportunity to explain where they're coming from, especially when you have one of them whose assumptions are at odds with the prevailing consensus. So, yes, sir. Well, I think we need to stop. Ah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ray. And thank you very, very much.